We've heard a number of talks today on a number of different topics, some looking at big questions, some looking at broad questions. I am going to close the day with a very, very precise question. A very simple question that actually it took an awful lot of research uh, to answer. Uh, my name is Ricky Carvel. Uh, you've seen me at the front here uh, a few times already today. Uh, I am lecturer in combustion and fire dynamics, uh, home in the Institute of Infrastructure and Environment. Uh, I do most of my teaching uh, in fire safety engineering uh, and uh, life safety engineering, uh, and I do most of my research looking at things like this. Uh, this, uh, I'm sure comes as no surprise to, to you, is a train going through a tunnel. Uh, and I'm particularly for the past, uh, alarmingly, 18 years now, uh, have spent uh, an awful lot of my time uh, studying how uh, safety systems operate uh, in tunnels, uh, particularly with regard to uh, fire safety, but I, I've kind of gone beyond that. But I'll be talking about fire safety uh, today. Uh, now, if you were to go on that train, and uh, eagle-eyed among you may have spotted that's a Eurostar train uh, coming out of the Channel Tunnel, um, if you were to go on that train, uh, it would take you from England to France, uh, through 51 kilometres of tunnel uh, in about half an hour, and you would have a, a not unreasonable expectation that when you go into that tunnel, you come out of that tunnel alive. Um, and indeed, there are systems put in place to try and ensure that your expectation is met. Um, it is a very safe mode of transport, the train, um, but it's not a perfect mode of transport. We know things sometimes go wrong, um, and the question I'm looking at today uh, just concerns one very, very tiny thing that could go wrong. Suppose there was a fire on that train, and that fire caused the train to stop in the tunnel. You have to get out of there. The problem is this. We've got a train track going through a tunnel. Um, we being the people that engineer the systems that uh, ensure your safety, have to deal with the fire and deal with the smoke. Now, in the built environment in general, in buildings, uh, I'm sure you're aware of sprinkler systems. Sprinkler systems in buildings deal with fires. They're maybe not perfect, but they do it quite well. Um, what you may not be uh, aware of, uh, particularly in larger spaces, uh, in shopping malls, uh, large HKS spaces, we actually do a lot of ventilation to deal with smoke. So basically in the built environment, sprinklers to deal with fire, ventilation to deal with the smoke. Um, the idea is to put something in between you, the person we're trying to save, uh, and the fire or the smoke. Keep the smoke away from you, keep the fire small, keep the fire away from you. Now for various complicated historical reasons that I'm not going to go into, um, in tunnels, for most of the history of tunnels, we've not installed sprinklers. Uh, Japan uh, and Australia are two countries that are exceptions to that rule. Uh, they tend to sprinkler tunnels uh, with gay abandon. Um, but through the rest of the world, sprinkler systems are rare. Uh, they're increasingly becoming more popular, but they're still very rare uh, things. Uh, the, the Tyne Tunnel uh, and the, uh, the Dartford Tunnel in the UK are the only two so far in the UK uh, with any form of, of water-based suppression system. So what's happened? We've got about 150 years uh, of experience of, of ventilation in tunnels. Um, so we tend to think of ventilation in tunnels as not merely a system to deal with the smoke, we think of it as also a, a system to deal with the fire. And most of the time that works. Here is a very schematic picture of a tunnel uh, with some vehicles going through it. Now, suppose one of those vehicles was to go on fire. What would we do? We've got a ventilation system. Well, we can blow it one way or the other. Which way are we going to blow it? Well, because that traffic there is not hindered by the fire in any way, that traffic goes away. So we can blow the smoke after it, protecting the people, I mean, you might not want to protect Dick Dastardly, but uh, protecting the people that form the queue behind the fire. Uh, and this has worked for many, many years in road tunnels. The problem comes when we're looking at rail tunnels. Um, rail tunnels 
the fire happens somewhere, the smoke starts spreading, the, the vehicles ahead of the fire are part of the same vehicle that's behind the fire. We can't simply drive these away. So what do we do with the ventilation? Well, the industry says, well, we still need to blow it away. We need to blow it somewhere. We've got the choice of blowing it that way or that way. What we're going to do, um, if we can localise the fire, we know where the fire is on the train, we'll blow the smoke away so that the majority of the people are saved. Does that make sense? So we've got 15 carriages on one side, three carriages on the other. We're going to blow the ventilation to save the 15 carriages. Now, if you're in one of those three carriages behind the fire, you may not be very happy at this point. Um, and hopefully you'll get out. But that's kind of the point. Hopefully you'll get out. Um, and so part of my research, the research that we've carried out here, uh, is thinking about the choice. We've got a choice to do something with the ventilation system. What choice should we actually might make to save lives in this situation when the only thing we can do is turn a ventilation system on? Now actually, it takes a lot of research to come to that answer. Um, and here are some of the big questions uh, that have been asked. Um, different research projects have addressed uh, all of these uh, issues over time. What is the right choice to make? is the project I'm talking about. Um, but basically, this project here relies um, on questions about how big the fire gets. Does ventilation, if you blow on a fire, does it change the fire? Have you ever lit a bonfire? You blow on it to get it going. Blowing on a fire changes the fire. You ever lit a match? You can blow it out. Blowing on the fire changes the fire, which is if we blow on a fire in a tunnel, does it get bigger? Does it go out? That's quite a simple one. It doesn't go out. But we do change it in some very complicated ways. But if we blow into smoke, we change the smoke. We dilute the smoke. We get more nice stuff in there and we dilute the nasty stuff. So questions of how dilute, um, how nasty the smoke is, uh, is another question we have to, to look at. We also need to understand how people actually survive in a smoke-laden environment. Um, how people move in smoke. Now these are related questions, but they're all actually separate uh, issues. And I'd love to say that the University of Edinburgh has done all the research for all of these questions, but we haven't. Um, the ones that I've been involved in, um, both in my time at Edinburgh and in the other great university from Edinburgh that I was uh, worked at for eight years as well, um, looking at questions of how big the fire would get and how ventilation changes the fire. That's been, I mean, that's, that's essentially my PhD thesis down there in that green box. Um, but we need to involve other people and there's some great research being done at the University of Central Lancashire by some of our colleagues there looking at toxicology and smoke. Some great work has been done uh, by BRE over many years looking at how toxic gases affect people. Um, some more recent work done by our colleagues uh, in Lund University in Sweden um, looking at how people actually get out um, of a train and actually move through a smoke-laden environment. Uh, not surprisingly, not very fast. Um, so actually to answer this question, we need to put all of these research together. And I'm not really going to give you uh, the details of all that research, just to say it's all part of the jigsaw. So the question is, uh, we've got a fan, we're going to use that fan to deal with the fire, to deal with the smoke. We blow on a fire, generally speaking the fire grows faster. It gets bigger. Um, and when we're dealing with an incident, it's very rarely a fire at its peak size. It's a fire that's growing. Because um, if we wait until the fire is massive, we've left ourselves a big problem. So we want to deal with these things fast. We blow on it, we get to peak size faster. We also get to a larger peak size. That's a problem. The smoke's more dilute, um, but we've now got more of it. And one of the, the simplest equations, I haven't put it on screen, but one of the simplest equations that I, I give uh, one of my fire safety classes uh, is that X kilograms of smoke plus Y kilograms of air equals X plus Y kilograms of smoke. Um, as you blow on it, you just get more smoke. 
the problem comes that the fire is the thing that produces the smoke. So all these things are related in a sort of very complex feedback loop. Uh, and essentially understanding that complex feedback loop was the, pro the, the point of this project. So, how should we use the ventilation? I should explain the, the egress strategy uh, in these trains, in these tunnels, is if there's an incident, you don't just get off the carriage you're on. Um, you will be instructed to go along the train to, to either the front or the rear and to get off uh, the door uh, at the front or the rear of carriage one, or they tend to be 18 carriages long, so the, the front of carriage one or the back of carriage 18, uh, certainly for Eurostar and some of the uh, big European ones. Um, you get off there and then you travel along, probably past the locomotive, um, until you reach a place of safety, a cross passage to uh, another tunnel. Worst case scenario, you've got about 350 metres to travel. So the question is, I'm not really interested in this project, uh, what conditions are like on the train. To begin with, it's a pressurised environment. The smoke takes a long time to get in, unless the fire happens to be inside, in which case it's a different problem. Um, but what I'm concerned about, what's the environment like as you get out of the tunnel and as you make your way uh, to the, safe, the place of safety? Um, so in this project, we, we considered a typical 18-carriage high-speed intercity train. Uh, we just looked at fires in three places. I could have looked at 18 different fire scenarios, but that would have been a bit of a waste of time. Uh, and so assumptions that we've made, uh, I've lined these up so that the fire is, is in the middle of the screen in each case. Um, three different fire locations. I've assumed that that fire has happened, worst case scenario, right beside a cross passage. So that particular cross passage is blocked. You can't get out there. You've got to travel 350 metres if you're at the place of the fire to get to uh, a place of safety. Um, so you're going to travel along the train, you're going to get off the train, uh, and then travel a bit in the tunnel. And you can do that in either direction. Um, and so really, what I'm interested in here is the tenability of the environment um, for these red arrows here. And apologies if anyone has red, green colour blindness. Um, but for these arrows in the tunnel, um, obviously some of them it's quite a short distance to travel, uh, some of them a considerably longer distance to travel. Um, I'm going to give you some results now. I should just explain, these graphs are presented very simply. Um, fractional effective dose, FED, is simply a measure of um, the, the amount of toxic stuff that you breathe in and smoke. Um, and basically, uh, when fractional effective dose gets to one, the conclusions for you are very bad. Um, so we want to avoid fractional effective dose being anywhere near yeah. one. Um, in most, there's a lots of probability comes into it, but fractional effective dose uh, of one uh, would probably result uh, in fatal effects for about 50% of the population uh, breathing that smoke. So one equals bad, zero equals good. I haven't shown zero, but zero's at the bottom. Um, so what I'm going to show you here, um, these axes here are basically graphs. Um, and as people go along the route, uh, we'll see the graphs growing um, according to the amount of stuff they breathe in uh, and nasty uh, things accumulating uh, and the, the effect in terms of fractional effective dose. Now, in the situation where we're blowing ventilation in one direction, obviously it's fairly trivial, uh, oh, sorry, smoke blowing that way, compared to smoke going in both directions. Um, the trivial case is, in the upstream, you're not breathing smoke. The green line stays in the bottom. The flip side of that is, we've got a fairly nasty environment on the downstream side. Um, because we're blowing all the smoke in one direction, um, because the fire has grown, um, the fractional effective dose uh, window goes something like that. The, the reason this isn't a line uh, is actually the bottom uh, edge of this graph represents the first person escaping from the train until they reach a place of safety. The top edge uh, represents the last one. Uh, in this scenario, it's about half the train. Um, everyone else is somewhere in between the two uh, lines. Now that's in the case if we blow uh, in one direction. If we don't blow, well actually you can see conditions down here are much nicer. Uh, there's a lot less nasty stuff being breathed in, but 
Obviously, conditions in this side uh, are slightly nastier. But I think you'll agree, in terms of the, the fractional effective dose, we're still, uh, for these people here, uh, reaching an FED of about 0.5 is actually not great. Some people will be hospitalized at that. It's not good. Um, whereas down here, everyone will be coughing a bit, but everyone gets out. That's if a virus in carriage nine. If we go to carriage five, again, we've got the trivial case here uh, of the green line. Uh, there's our graphs uh, in our direction. You'll note that this one now doesn't go up quite as high because it's a shorter path. Uh, that one goes up a bit higher because it's a longer path, but still nicely away from an FED of one. Not so for the ventilated case. Um, because people are now entering the environment uh, much closer to the fire, uh, and because they're spending longer in the smoke-laden environment, uh, the accumulation of toxic products is actually quite nasty. Uh, and you're thinking, hang on, you said you did three cases, you've shown us two. Yeah. If the fire's in carriage two, uh, you're coming out only about 40 metres, well, between 20 and 40 metres away from where the fire is. Uh, you've got a very long uh, egress path. Um, if we don't blow, actually it still stays fairly low. The reason for this is the fire is growing slowly. The fire doesn't reach a very large size during the, the time of egress. If we do blow, um, unfortunately conditions uh, deteriorate uh, to the point at which um, I would expect from these numbers, I mean, I can't be absolutely sure about these numbers, but certainly in ballpark figures, uh, I would not necessarily expect any of the 50 or so people that would have to escape in that direction to, to survive uh, in this scenario. So what can I conclude from that? Well, it doesn't actually matter where the fire is on the train. I don't need to locate it because I've already shown that irrespective of where the, the fire is, everyone can get out if we don't blow. But in some scenarios, um, people can uh, be exposed to, to lethal uh, smoke if we do blow. And yet people say, I've got these systems. I paid literally millions of pounds to put a ventilation system in my tunnel. I have to use it. No. You didn't install it just as a safety system. It still has other functions. It's there for every day running the tunnel. But sometimes the right thing to do uh, is to switch off the expensive system uh, and just let uh, things run their course. Um, think before you use anything expensive. Um, and what I mean by think is, of course, get the University of Edinburgh to investigate the question. Thank you very much for your attention. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.